This is the Sony a7S III. This was one of the most anticipated cameras for video shooters this year. You know, I don't really consider myself a pro video shooter, but because of my YouTube channel, I've been shooting a lot of videos in the past two years. I don't shoot any videos professionally, but considering all the time I spend on shooting and editing, I probably spend more time with videos than photos nowadays. So I guess that makes me a hybrid shooter, and there's a growing number of people like me every year, and more and more people are starting to shoot videos regardless of their experience of shooting photos. So I thought I'd approach this review a little differently. Instead of just repeating what everyone else has been saying about how great this camera is for video, I'm going to focus mainly on two things. Is this camera good enough for photos for hybrid shooters? And is this a bit of an overkill for non-professional video shooters? Now, if you've known me for a while, you know I'm the last person to tell you that you need the latest and greatest cameras to create good results. Realistically, all you really need to shoot a decent video nowadays is a smartphone. For both photos and videos, if you don't know what you're doing, getting a high-end pro camera can actually hurt you more than help you, not only in terms of the results that you get, but obviously also financially. But if you're an intermediate level video shooter and you're really serious about improving your videos and you want a good camera to grow with without having to worry about upgrading for many years, a camera like this might be worth it, as long as it's in your budget of course. So first, let's take a look at the photo capabilities of this camera. I guess the main concern for most hybrid shooters would be the resolution. This camera has a 12 megapixel sensor or 12.1 to be exact, so about half of the resolution of most other Sony interchangeable lens cameras except the a7R line. I get a lot of questions from people regarding how many megapixels they need and there's really no right or wrong answers for that and it all depends on what you're going to do with your photos. But I can tell you that if you're mainly going to be using your photos for web and social media, 12 megapixels should be more than enough. A 12 megapixel image from the a7S III has the resolution of 4240 by 2832, so roughly 50% more pixels than a 4K TV. So if your images will be seen mostly on computer screens or smartphones and tablets, no one will ever notice or even care that they are 12 megapixel images, unless you're going to be severely cropping your images. And as you may know, there are benefits of having lower resolution sensors as well. The most obvious is the low light performance. We're going to compare the a7S III with the a7III, which is one of the best cameras on the market for low light. And we're also going to throw the a6600 into the mix just to show you what you can get by upgrading to full frame. By the way, all three of these images were taken with the same settings, same white balance, and the same lens, just at different focal lengths because the a6600 is a crop sensor camera. But the color and the exposure seem a little different. It's not unusual for different cameras to produce different results, so I just wanted you to see that without tweaking the images. Compared to the a7 III, the a7S III's images seem a bit warmer. Obviously, color is subjective, so I can't say that one is objectively better, and you can easily match one with the other if you wanted to. But Sony's been constantly fiddling with their color science with pretty much every new camera that they came up with, so you just have to be aware that you may need to edit your photos and videos a little differently. Anyway, back with the low light performance, I would say the a7S III performs at least about one full stop better than the a7 III, and about two stops better than the a6600. Here are the three cameras at ISO 51200, and as you can see, the a7S III still does incredibly well, while the a6600 starts to really fall apart. Here's ISO 100,000, which is the highest expanded ISO for the a6600, and the a7S III still looks pretty good here. And here's ISO 200,000, and the a7 III seems like it has finally reached its limit, and the a7S III also looks like it's starting to run out of steam here. Bring the a7S III up to ISO 400,000, which is its maximum ISO, these two images now seem more comparable. So can you use the a7S III for photos? Absolutely. I mean, compared to the a7 III, you're basically giving up half of the resolution to gain a full stop advantage in low light, so you just need to figure out what can benefit you more for your work. So if you're the type of photographer who is always on the go, who mainly shoots for digital content, always shooting in different locations where you don't always have the best lighting, the a7S III could actually be your main photo camera. I mean, still, I probably wouldn't recommend this camera if you don't shoot any videos at all, but what I'm saying is that this isn't necessarily a worse stills camera than the a7 III. They're just different cameras meant for different situations. Before we move on to the next topic, let me just point out some of the new things on the body design. 
Starting with some of the minor things, they switched the placement of the movie record button with the C1 button at the top. This might be useful if you're going to be in front of the camera a lot, and I personally really like this. They rearranged the mode dial so the manual and movie modes are right next to each other. But considering this is mainly a video camera, I wish there were more movie mode options on the dial than the photo modes. This is such a complex camera with so many different options for movies, dedicating half of the dial to photo mode seems like a missed opportunity. And this was one of the biggest complaints most people had on Sony cameras, the clips on each side that always dangle around and make noise, the stupidest thing ever and especially annoying for shooting video. I think they made them slightly thicker so they don't flap around and they always stay in place. I'm glad that one of the biggest consumer electronics companies in the world have finally figured this out after almost a decade. And they have yet again redesigned the memory card compartment door and I wish the joint wasn't right on the edge of the grid because it creates a bit of a rough seam here. But this might wear off with use or you could probably sand it off slightly if it really bothers you. I'm not going to do that with this because this isn't my camera. The camera has two card slots and both slots can take either SD or CF Express Type A cards which is pretty cool. One thing that I didn't expect, the A7S III currently has arguably the best viewfinder on the market with the resolution of 9.4 million dots which is 4 times more than the A7 III's viewfinder with the impressive 0.9 magnification ratio. One big disappointment though, the rear LCD screen screen resolution still stayed at 1.4 million dots, which is about 30% less than the Canon R5 or the Nikon Z7 screens. But Sony has finally put a fully articulating screen on their full frame body, and for shooting video, I do prefer this design. I think this was the right decision for Sony. On the left side, there are all the usual ports like headphone and microphone jacks, USB-C, and a full-size HDMI, which is pretty rare to see on cameras like this. But I noticed one big problem problem with this layout. When you have your headphones plugged in, you cannot tilt the screen upward. If you're shooting videos handheld, you're probably going to be holding your camera like this so you can look down at the screen. But if you can't tilt the screen, that pretty much defeats the whole purpose of having a flippy screen. You can flip the screen behind the cover and put it at about 90 degree angle. But this wouldn't have been a problem in the first place if they put the headphone jack at the front instead of at the back. But finally, Sony has redesigned their menu system and added touch capabilities to their screen. The touch isn't like smartphone smooth, but navigating the menu felt much more responsive than with their older cameras. With their older menu, you always had to mindlessly scroll dozens of pages without knowing what comes before and after. But with the new design, you can easily see what's in the sub menus without having to go through all the pages. So this alone could potentially save you lots of time. And now let's take a look at the video capabilities of this camera. What exactly do you gain when you get this instead of cameras like the a7 III or I guess the a7C or the a6600? On paper, you get 4K 422 10-bit, which none of the other cameras have, and it can record 4K up to 120p while the other cameras can only do that in 1080. In 1080, the a7S III can shoot up to 240 frames per second. But to be able to record 120 or 240p, you need a memory card with writing speed of at least 60 or 90 megabytes per second respectively. Just check if your card says V60 or 90, then you'll be good to go. While recording externally, you can shoot 16-bit RAW at 4264 by 2408 up to 60p, which is slightly wider and shorter than its 12 megapixel image of 4240 by 2832. I mean, specs like these may not mean much to most non-pro shooters. If it does matter to you, it's got it. If you don't know what they are, you probably don't need them. I'm not going to go into what all the different numbers mean here, but the most obvious difference or the benefit that you can expect from the a7S III again is the low light performance. Crop sensor cameras like the a6600 can really struggle past ISO 3200 in most situations, but the a7S III can push well over 50,000 and the videos will not only be usable, but they will still look good. Just so you can appreciate how good this camera is in low light, here's the video footage next to the image basically matched to what my eyes could see. 
If you're a travel vlogger, you probably won't need to carry your light anymore with this thing. This can pretty much transform night into day. You can almost use this as a night vision. Like many newer Sony cameras, there's no 30 minute recording limit, which means you can keep recording as long as there's enough storage space and power. This is obviously useful for shooting longer videos or interviews or performances because you don't always have to babysit your camera and check to make sure it's still recording every few minutes. While shooting 4K24, the battery lasted about 2 hours and 30 minutes, which is about an hour more than what I was able to get with the Canon R5 and the R6. And unlike those cameras, with the auto off temperature set to high, I was able to record the entire time without any overheating warnings or shutoffs. In fact, after draining one battery, I started recording with another battery and the camera still didn't overheat. The camera did get a bit warm overall, but not enough to be concerned. And while recording for almost 5 hours straight, it did not give me any warnings and it just kept going. One interesting thing to note, normally when I test the battery life, most cameras last longer while shooting 1080 than 4K. The R6 for example lasts almost 2 times longer shooting 1080 than 4K. But the A7S 3s battery life seems to show no difference while shooting 1080 or 4K. They both lasted about 2.5 hours. The sensor stabilization has also been upgraded and in my opinion, this is the best stabilization that I've tried on a Sony camera. I mean, don't expect a gimbal-like performance, the results will greatly vary depending on the user, but this is my first time trying a Sony full-frame camera and noticing the IBIS is actually doing something. Unlike on the other Sony cameras, they also added the active mode, which adds a bit of digital stabilization by cropping into the frame, and while shooting handheld, combined with the lens's optical stabilization, the difference was very clear even at longer focal lengths. And lastly, this has been Sony's Achilles heel for 4K video, the rolling shutter. I've been using the A6600 as my main video camera for the past few months, and every time I would move the camera a little too quickly, everything on the screen would turn into jello. But on the A7S III, it was virtually non-existent. I mean, it's there if you really try to look for it, but while shooting normally, it's not going to be an issue, a huge improvement overall. So, should you buy this camera? Well, at $3,500, this is obviously not a cheap camera at all. But I don't think many people would argue with the fact that this is one of the best video cameras for $3,500. It's got the image quality, the best low light performance, it's got all the video features you want and need. If you can afford it, I can't think of many reasons to stop you. There are some small quirks and annoyances, but nothing that I would consider a deal breaker. Even though this is probably the most advanced camera that Sony has ever made, with the new menu design, I was still able to figure everything out within minutes, which is a completely different experience than when I first tried other Sony cameras. Also for shooting photos, like I said, unless you need to severely crop your photos, this will give you the cleanest images in any situation, the file sizes will be much smaller. If you mainly take photos for Instagram and any sort of digital media, this should be perfect for that. Again, spending $3,500 on a camera for Instagram and YouTube may not make sense to everyone, and no matter how good your camera is, your content will only be as good as you. But some people spend double that amount on a Leica, and they probably have good reasons for that too. All I'm saying is, if you've been wondering what the best camera is for today's digital content creator, this is probably it.